Time to fire up the VCR. This one's my favorite. Welcome to Analog Jones in the Temple of Film. I'm Steve. And I'm Matt. And we're a VHS podcast that looks at the trailers, box art, and behind the scenes. And we actually get to do a VHS this week. And it's our America Month. Matt, introduce what tape you picked. I picked a movie called American Nightmare because it had America in the title. (laughs) (laughs) I love this because it is a movie that is shot in Toronto. Yes. Pretending to be Chicago, possibly, but kind of looks more like New York. Right. Which yes. is very odd. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I for before I heard the crazy Canadian accents, I thought it was New York. I was like convinced. I was like, oh, this is like one of those basket case, driller killer type, like skeezy forty second street New York movies. And then like I some of those thick Canadian accents started happening. I was like Oh, yeah, no, this is super Canada. (laughs) Yeah, you can definitely hear it, especially when you have some of the, like, super small side characters. Yeah. I'm trying to think maybe one of the scummy um, characters that was holding all the beta tapes. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I could hear a little bit of this. Uh, Yeah. A little Minnesota, a little Canadian mix. Did you did you look up and see what part of Canada this was filmed? It's in? Toronto. It's because it actually sounded more like a Montreal or Vancouver, where the accents are even thicker. That's what I thought it would be. I but Toronto, okay. Yeah, so I went and uh, the only reason that I know that they're pretending to be Chicago in this is because I went to uh, some Canada reviews of it. And they specifically wanted it to look like Chicago. And I'm like, I, I think it looks more like New York. I mean, they nailed the New York look. I wish <laughs> they would have just embraced that because they, like, nailed it. Well, all those 80s movies of the, the scummy. Like, yeah, the ones that, yeah. Yeah, you know, you've got, uh, what is it, Maniac. Yeah. And everything. Where they, well, I don't know. Was Maniac New York? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they all looked that 80s aesthetic of, like, everything looks greasy and grimy and dirty and gross and we got to get you know reagan as president to clean up america get those yeah. drugs out of the streets yeah this was this was 83 so this is early 80 so yeah. it has absolutely that look but like i feel like the chicago movies that i've seen from this time they almost look more polished i feel like that's what they needed to do was add more of a sheen to it because mm-hmm. when I think about, I mean, I know it was a little bit later in the 80s, but, like, the way they present Ferris Bueller, Chicago, everything's mm-hmm. sleek. Or even Blues Brothers, that's from this time, yeah. 80. Everything's sleek. Well, and we, New York's supposed to be dirty. Like, that's the way that movies portrayed them. Well, one, we have alleys, so we can put our trash in the alleys and cover it up like humans. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hide our shame. Yeah. <laughs> We're very good at it. We're from the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that was the thing. Now, I, I don't think I noticed any of the trash in the streets on this. But, yes, I think they just, especially when they went through the theater in the movie, the, like, uh, skeezy porn playing theater. Yeah, that, that 42nd Street style theater. Yeah, 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 it's completely, yeah, you, yeah. So, anyway, uh, here's some details on this. And, like I already said, it was made in Toronto, but for $200,000 in 1981. Wow. Yeah, and this was part of the... Canada, like people getting tax breaks. Mm. Uh, Canada was just handing out money to all these filmmakers, and this was during the time period of Canuck. Uh, what is it? Uh, Canuck exploitation. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is when Cronenberg was coming up at yeah. this time, '83. Well, he was already making video drum. Yeah. He had already made it. Point. Yeah, we had movies like what Prom Night, Terror Train, Valentine. What is that? Bloody My Bloody Bloody Valentine, Valentine was Canadian. Happy so, Birthday to Me was Canadian. Yeah, Cronenberg stuff like Rabbit and Shivers were all that all of that Canuck exploitation was, genre. Was Scanners? Yeah, is Scanners that Canadian? still was. Yeah, that's before okay. he broke mainstream. Yeah, that was the last. That was the one that broke him mainstream. Okay, was Scanners? Yeah, yeah, I didn't know if that one was taped in you know in like yeah, Toronto or whatever. Yeah, I think that one is still Canadian. All right, that's interesting. This actually sell, uh, was made specifically to take advantage of two markets. The VHS boom, 
and the fact that we didn't have free porn on the internet, kids. <laughs> so your dad had to rent something like this, and then every once in a while in the movie, they would shove in completely random, pointless nudity. Yes. That lasted too long. I don't know about too long. <laughs> <laughs> Some of these strip tees in this in the Just strip club. Just about long enough. <laughs> they were like five minutes. That one. Uh, uh, I didn't check. Couple the of counter. them too short, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so you're going to be playing the dirty old man on this podcast. I like it. That's my character tonight. <laughs> yeah, the executive producer on this was kind of like the king of Canada exploitation, which was Paul Lynch. Please don't call me David Lynch, Paul Lynch. He worked on the Prom Night movies. Well, yeah, he directed Prom Night. I don't know if he directed any of the other ones, but probably produced them. Yeah, he worked. He, I knew. I know that name from when we were doing prom night too. <laughs> yeah, here's a crazier thing. The director of this, Don McBreetley, I maybe that's how you pronounce his name. He fucking won an Oscar for his short film, 1984. Well, the film came out in '83 called Boys and Girls, and he won the Oscar in '84. Wow. Well, so it was after this. Yeah. I mean, this was shot in 81, right? Yeah, shot in 81. Yeah. Stayed on the shelves for a while. I don't know why. <laughs> then they were like, this guy's going to win an Oscar. Put that tape out. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, it's funny. That's really all the behind the scenes on this. I mean, it's just a sleazy VHS that was kind of interesting because it found a lot of talent. And, it, and the only reason that I picked this movie up ever, you know, the only reason I was interested in it, it wasn't in the horror section. It was in, like, the mystery suspense section, and it's actually labeled on here like that, too. It, I picked it up because of the cover. I had never heard of it. I knew nothing about it. Uh, but I, this must have done well enough on VHS. Well, this was, you know, supposed to be like the the Italian, uh, was it, Gylo films? Yeah. Where it's that uh, mystery literature, mm. where everything's kind of over the top, and it, it can't be just like a flat story where it's just like this person killed this person and we got to find them. They throw all this crazy, um, I don't even know, like U turns in it. Well, yeah, I would actually. That's a that's a huge good point. I would actually say this is one hundred percent the definition of a Canadian giallo film. You've yeah. got the black glove killer. It's a mystery. You've got the people investigating the murders mm-hmm. that get caught up in it. Like it is prototype. For yeah. those Italian mystery movies, but made in Canada. <laughs> yeah, and they even throw in, like, the people on the streets actually are the good people, while the people behind the desk with all the money are, are the, the bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very much of these this genre. Is that how you pronounce it? Is it Gilo or Gilo? Uh, I always say Giallo. Giallo. But I think the the L's are Y's, so it's like Giallo or something, but I can never say it. So I just say giallo. Welcome to the spelling bee and grammar lesson on Analog Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into this. Why did you rent this slash buy this? Uh, the cover. I had never seen it. I would never heard of it. I, actually, up until we watched it, I had never seen it or heard of it. <laughs> it sat on my shelf. I picked it up when the video store was closing. I think this was the same video store that I snatched up G.I. Joe and Fern Gully, which we'd done. So yeah. we're just going to do all those that I picked up at that video store. <laughs> I love that you bought this at the same time as Fern Gully. Yeah, it, same stack, for sure. Amazing. I, I I knew, I had heard the title American Nightmare before because the Misfits did a song around the same time this movie came out, and I don't know if that was purposely timed or whatever. Sort of just was like, cool, I'll pick it up. No history with it, never seen it, never heard of it, never heard anybody talking about it. Didn't watch it until we did this podcast. <laughs> yeah, same. I'd never heard of this. You want to describe the box art on this bad boy? Yeah, here's the uh, here's the reason I picked this up. I think we'd agree that, of course, you would pick this up, right? Yeah, this is <laughs> this is so weird and obscure. <laughs> Front cover is in the sort of media box within a box. So we've got like the media logo taking up the bottom with the cast and the genre where it says mystery suspense, but the picture within this box is a face that's clearly painted looking frightened with the glove and the bloody knife like next to its head and it just says American Nightmare and it looks like the knife is cutting Nightmare and Nightmare starting to split that's it and it's just black behind them it's really cool yeah it's a very simple little box art here that's painted kind of almost looks like airbrush yeah yeah, it's definitely one of those, it's going to catch weirdos like us. It's going to catch our eyes. 
Yeah, I absolutely think I would have picked this up as a kid, too, if I, like, saw this. I would have been like, oh, yeah, yeah, gotta see this. <laughs> yeah, and as an adult, as soon as I see media, like, distributed it, and I'm like, oh, it's weird. It's gonna be trashy. <laughs> um, the back here has sleaze on it right away. It has the one of the strippers. I think our, it looks like our main girl that we follow on the back here uh, in... Lou- in her bra and panties, it looks like, on the back here. Is her name Louise? I don't remember. It doesn't matter. <laughs> a fight that looks like the end fight scene from the movie. Oh, it very much is. Where, which which is reveals the killer. Uh, and then a woman crying that I don't even really remember. Oh, this was the character with the uh, boyfriend, right? The one that didn't want her to strip anymore? Yeah, he wanted to marry her. Yeah. So she's, like, looking sad in the corner. But here's here's our description. Starring Lawrence Day, Laura Stanley, Lenore Zan, every year, girls move to the city determined to make their dreams come true or die trying. They've got that as, like, the tagline here. Mm-hmm. And here's our description description. This is a brutally realistic examination of the underbelly of urban degradation. Damn. Starting us off strong. <laughs> yeah, these Canadians might want to calm down on their big words. Played against a garish background of striptease, pornography, drug peddling, and prostitution, it is the story of, it, like, it is. I like how this is, it is, they won't, like, actually say the title. It is the story of a young man's search for his sister. He finds an ally and her roommate, and together they investigate her life and her friends. As they uncover a series of murders, a pattern emerges which leads them to his father's telethon. And a, te- a psycho psychotically avenging moralist an American ripper the reality surrounding a young girl's death and the occupation of her father's organization surface as American nightmare this shocking and revealing film is a story you won't soon forget recommended for mature audiences contains nudity (laughs) color 85 minutes contains nudity a lot of freaking nudity yeah a lot of stripping a lot of stripping in this movie. Yeah, they they shove boobs in this. I would say almost every ten minutes. Yeah, or or less. There's a there's a lot of man butt too. So I mean, at least it's equal ish. Yeah. there's boobs and butt. They're trying. They're uh, trying. I don't think any of the dudes are good looking. I think all the dudes are super fucking gross though. <laughs> it's like yeah, you get some dude butt for well, the ladies, but I don't want to see that. <laughs> yeah, that's what they do in this film. Uh, almost all the guys are terrible. Yeah. Except our lead man, Eric, which is, man, talk about a dry actor. Yeah, very forgettable. Yeah. Oh, um, but he's pretty much him and Dolly. And I'll get into Dolly, but my favorite character is Dolly. I, I You might have known that right when you watched it. <laughs> She's great. She's fun to watch. My favorite character is the neighbor, the gay well, neighbor. I, mean, I love him. Yeah, he's so that's fun. Dolly. Oh, who's, who's the... Uh, Who's the girl he's with? That he's uh, her name is Louise, I think. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and then the sister's name is Isabella. So we'll explain all of this. At the very beginning, there is a young nude girl in a bed, clearly a prostitute, smoking dope, mm. got off a conversa- you know, phone call that's like, well, here, I'll play it right here since we don't have a trailer, might as well. Yeah. Hello, Fixer? Okay, now, did you get it? Who's this? It's Floyd in the office. Hello, Floyd. Oh, shit, you gooped up again. Straighten up for you? Did you get the bread? Uh-huh. I'm just sticking around a few minutes, see if I can turn some extra bucks. Well, I'll just get the hell out of there before he finds out the tapes are blank. Did you hear me? I'm telling you. Did you hear me? Get the hell out of there now. Man, are we gonna make it or what? Wow. Hey, that's pretty kinky. (laughs) I'm so ready for you, baby. I'm so wet. I can hardly wait. Come on down here, baby. I want to hold you. You feel so good. You feel so good against me. Mm. It's okay. 
It's okay. Don't be so uptight. There's no cameras tonight. Honest. They promised. It's okay. It's okay. So she gets off this phone call. Get, get out of there! And she's like, ah, I'm going to try to pick up some more money off this guy. <laughs> and by the way, that is a young... That is a young Alexandra Paul from Baywatch, and she is barely legal. They said she just turned 18. Wow. So she was nude in there, and I was like, because like, when you look at her, I was like, man, this looks like a girl from high school, like 16. It was creepy mm. out. Yeah. But anyway. Which, like, it's gross that she's naked, but like, it's kind of the point, because she is too young to be in this world, and that's why the brother's looking for her. So it's kind of the point, but still creepy that she's naked in the first shot of the movie. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, this opens straight up on the phone call over the credits, and then boom, it's just a girl smoking dope, topless. Mm. Which then has an old man come out with plastic gloves on like a surgeon, and she's like, oh, that's kinky. Bullshit. No woman would say that. They'd be like, I'm going to die. Yeah. This guy's definitely going to kill me. <laughs> yeah, because she's like, oh, I'm so wet. And I was like, ah, I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> and I immediately wrote in my notes, what the fuck is Matt having me watch? Oh, uh, I started this and I was like, yep, this is exactly like my kind of thing. This is <laughs> this is the kind of garbage that I just watch when I'm by myself anyway. So, yep, this is right this is right on brand for me. <laughs> Dirty old Matt. <laughs> so, he grabs a beta tape after he cuts her throat. Yeah. Uh, which I think was he slits a couple throats in this. Yeah. Spoiler, it's a man. <laughs> yeah. If we didn't know that, but they go into it, they immediately don't really waste, even though this is a slow burn movie, they don't waste time getting to the main characters. Because then we have Eric, who had received a letter from Isabel about a couple days earlier saying she's in grave danger, which she really didn't seem like she was when she was on the bed. <laughs> um, no one seems to be very concerned about Isabel being gone. She... Well, she was a wild child. The yeah. roommate is like, whatever, she does this. And, like, she's mixed up with these pimps and everything. It's just like, that's her life now. Yeah, and then Luis is the her roommate, which also works at the strip club. Uh, she's like, yeah, I don't know. No one seems concerned. Mm. And then he talks to Dolly, the transvestite next door, which is just glorious. I love this character. Oh. I forgot I forgot his... It, does it identify as a him or her in this movie? I don't know. I, uh, well... Dolly, we'll say her. Let's say her, to yeah. be politically Well, I, I think it's like he doesn't want to change. He just likes to dress up. He's, he's gay and he's in women's clothing. Okay, so it would be he then. Yeah. Okay, so he, him. But yeah, and if anyone wants to explain the difference between a transvestite and um, a drag queen, I, I, I know I could Google it. But I want a fan to tell me. That's right. Somebody explain it, and we we are very uh, accepting people. So like, yeah. you just just tell it. We don't mean to be offensive. If we sound offensive right now, we just don't. We don't know. We no. don't know that world. <laughs> I think Dolly rocks. Yeah, no, D- Dolly is my favorite. character. And is a smart too. character. Yeah, uh, this dude, this actor, showed up immediately in this movie. I was like, I like him. You looking for somebody? Oh, Mary. I hope it's me. I'm uh, I'm looking for a girl, Isabel. Isabel Blake. I was uh, told she lives in this building. Do you know her? No. I'm her brother. Now that one. She told me her name was Tanya. Tanya? I always thought it was a bit stagey, too. Most of the girls do it, you know. Do it? Change the names. Of course. Mine's Dolly. Anyway, she's not at home. And when she is at home, she lives down there. Right at the end? When did you last see her? A couple of days ago, maybe. Ah, can you tell me where she works? 
Sorry. Cat. Yep. I like, like, it just immediately was like, I'm in, I'm in. Love, love this character. Yeah, defensive when he didn't know who Eric was, but then once he realizes Eric is uh, Isabel's brother and clearly has concern over her well-being, he seems to both of them, Leslie and him, seem to immediately go into helping. Yeah. So, like, you have intelligent characters. It's not like they're being defensive way too long for no reason. Right. But we get, Im- like, just sent right into this scummy world. Because Eric then goes to his father, which we find is, like, a media mogul. Mm-hmm. Who is rich and cold. And his mother is dead. So, I guess he was left to raise them. And he sucked. So she ran away from home like two years ago at 16 and is living on the streets. And Eric goes off and somehow becomes like a grand pianist. Yeah. Which is on magazine covers. I Does that happen? And then, yeah, he's a grand pianist that's on magazine covers, but is also like a better like investigator than any of the police. <laughs> like, he, this guy should definitely like Moonlight as a detective because this guy <laughs> has his shit together. And like I kept forgetting that he was an artist. Like I kept forgetting that he played the piano. I kept thinking he was like a cop or a detective or something as the movie would go on, but I was like, no, like he's just looking for his sister. I'm like, he's the only one that can figure any of this shit out. <laughs> Pause, we have to uh, put in our stripper right now. Let's go. Oh, okay, go. yep. Yep. Uh, All right. Now we got a stripper and now we can continue talking continue about the, the movie. plot. <laughs> we'll, we'll just pretend like we're the movie here. Every yeah. five minutes a stripper. <laughs> yeah. And a strip scene. <laughs> and oh man, the guys in the, the fucking crowd of every one of these strip queens are like, Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Like they've never seen a nude woman right. a day in their life. They've yeah. This is like every crowd of people that have never been to a strip club ever, all in one strip club at once, just screaming and howling. I've been to a strip club twice in my life ever, um, and it is fucking silent in there. Besides, the <laughs> yeah. So some of them you get in there. I, I've been on bachelor parties where it's just like a blast. Everyone's happy like that. But this was like a bunch of like old men, like 40s right. and 50s. They're like, oh, my life's over. Might as well see some hoo-hahs before I go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're like, and they're screaming like they're college kids. Yeah. Like, come on. Yeah. But it, it, it did make me laugh. It is of that time period. It's, yeah, it's just so of the time. It's like, yeah, it's just great. It's wonderful. Sadly, this is like when women are treated like complete objects. And that's the point of this movie. Like like Independence Day when we saw Vivica A. Fox as the stripper. Yeah. She was like owning it. She's like, I'm doing this to make money, to mm. kind of maybe even an art form. And she was proud of it. Yeah. This movie, on the other hand, it's just gross. Right. These are like, they have no other choice. Right. So. And I mean, the movie has questionable intentions with it where it's like. It shows them as real people and not just odd. Like, you see the stripper. It has questionable intentions in that, like, it's like, it's almost saying that stripping is a scummy world, which it's not because of Vivica Fox's character. Some people love it and embrace it and everything like that. It's saying, like, stripping is scummy, but these people are good. And it's like, well, okay, your intentions are kind of good here, movie, but... (laughs) Yeah, it is interesting because it's, it's surrounded it with a scummy world. But it's not like their manager was really... Well, their manager wasn't treating them great, but he wasn't mistreating them. Right. And some of them were actually doing it because they liked it. Right. Uh, the main character, Louise, was doing it because she was like she felt like she was an artist and could express herself doing it. Right. And then you had the blonde girl who didn't want to leave because she liked it. She enjoyed it, but the boyfriend yeah. was like, you gotta stop doing this. So yeah. it, it was a very odd... Like, they're trying to expose the underbelly of the city, which they do, but at the same time... The characters are so kind of likable. Right, right. It, it's very weird. Yeah, I yeah. don't know what their 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 intentions are good here. I can see that, but I'm not sure what their message they're going for. Well, it gets so muddled. Yeah, I you you reminded me, and maybe I'm jumping ahead here in the plot, but like obviously, the, our main character and uh, what's her name, Louise, fall in love. Obviously, the roommate and. The main character. Yeah. Obviously, the one the guy's looking for his sister and her Please roommate. Please tell me him. you're going to talk about one of the most awkward sex scenes of all time. No, no, no. Better. The seduction strip scene. Incredible. Incredible scene. Like... That actress is going all out. Yes. Yes. Like, I... 
I like in no way during that scene was I as a viewer titillated, but I was like, like this is actually a great scene. <laughs> like yeah. it was, it was like the director was having so much fun at it or something, and she was having so much fun in the scene. I was like, damn, this is a good scene in this movie. <laughs> yeah, she did such a good job that I'm like, you know what? I I think she and him probably had something behind the scenes. Because he's sitting there like a fucking flat board with yeah, no he's expression. Got, yeah, he's nothing. But. but she's going all out, like seducing him on stage while everyone out, like it kind of grows silent in her music. <laughs> and then you're, you're like, wow, this actress fucking went all out. And then the David character, or Eric, stabs a dude in the fucking alley to get away. Like, I guess he was being mugged. Yeah. And then she's like, oh, I'm boning him. <laughs> it's just like... He stabbed a dude for me. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then it's on, like, Donkey Kong, and then we get the super awkward sex scene. Oh, my which, like, gosh. great scene, and then just, like, cringe. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. She's at one time riding him on top and then, like, bends over backwards with her arms spread out. And I'm like, wait, is she's like, flying? <laughs> or is she being crucified by Jesus? What the fuck is happening? <laughs> crucified by that cock. <laughs> hey Gross. Oh, it's such a bad scene. Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. And after I like loved that that one scene, I was like, wow, that's a really good scene. Versus that, I was like, oh no, we're back in American Nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> so the the character just goes around cutting girls' throat. The the murderer right. goes around cutting girls' throats, uh, drowning them, uh, you know, just choking them out, and, and they're pretty lame. For the yeah. most part. It's not a particularly it's, gruesome movie. But I think they're doing it on purpose to make it look real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it looks like uh, like those 70s documentary style. Like Maniac does. Kind yeah. of that same look of Maniac. Except yeah. Maniac was super gory. There are scenes here that make me uncomfortable. Not so much, again, it's not grotesque. It's actually kind of real. But maybe that's what made me uncomfortable. And this movie has a very claustrophobic shooting style. Yes, Constant close-ups. Tight. Very. Everything's tight. I know. I felt so uncomfortable. You feel dirty and uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, so I have to give this movie's like aesthetic feel an A. Oh yeah, I agree because that's what I fucking loved about this movie. It's just how nar nasty it was. Just nasty. <laughs> <laughs> just it's like nailed it, which I I think was the intention too because. Obviously, Toronto was, like, beautiful, and they made it look like skeezy, gross New York and nailed the feel, like... Yeah, I don't think they shot hardly any of this movie in the daylight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they, they picked all the, like, seedy corners that Toronto had. They're like, ah, the, oh, it's the not three, seedy enough. <laughs> the three seedy corners of Toronto. <laughs> Throw some trash in it! Yeah, oh, man, yeah. Just, and yeah, the, the shooting style and the close-ups and the, you know, the Black Love Killer and stuff like that is, like, gross, now, I noticed on the back of this, they said, like, Ripper. I'm assuming right. they meant, like, Jack the Ripper. Because he's killing prostitutes yeah. and strippers. I actually yes. never picked up on this, because, like, Jack the Ripper was, like, a, a mystery no one could solve. And this one, I think it's pretty fucking obvious that when the, the guy comes in, he goes, Hey, don't you fuck with your dad's media. <laughs> you know, he's like, hey, he put this whole thing together for all these uh, underprivileged young youths. So they can get back off the street and, and be a good part of society. And I was like, oh, well, the irony here is fucking blatant. <laughs> but, and as soon as that guy was on screen, I was like, well, it's got to be him. Because it's not the father. The father, first of all, they show, they also show the killer's hair yeah. in one of the scenes. So it was also obvious. But I had a fun time on the ride of this sleaziness. I actually forgot about that guy, and then they revealed the killer. I was like, who's that guy? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I literally had that moment. <laughs> that's also part of this. Like, they're trying to confuse you by throwing so much, like, twists. Right. And then when they, they reveal the killer, I'm like, which one was that again? Like, I literally forgot. I had a Roy the Ambulance Driver moment from Friday 13th 5, where I was like, which one? Who's that again? <laughs> it took me years to figure out who the killer was in Friday the 13th right. 5. Like, right. who, like, and when I rewatched it as an adult, they, like, show, is like, oh, my gosh, it's him. They show the son, the fat kid that got killed, and I'm yeah. like, how did young Steve not figure this out? Because he's, that guy's such a forgettable character, though. Like, 
by the time the whole journey goes on, it's like, wait, who's that? Like, <laughs> yeah, I all I as a kid, I always forgot about Roy. Well, it's funny too because the killer in this has that over the top, like obnoxious personality. Yeah. Where he thinks he's doing the right thing by doing something awful. Yeah. He he explains it in a very long very long monologue at the end <laughs> i know i blanked out yeah like, i was just uh, like okay we get it like they're strippers and prostitutes you have to kill them we get it. like you don't have to go on this like eight minute long speech about it <laughs> so we should talk about pretty much the greatest canadian man crush of all time yes michael ironside is the detective in this mike ironside is oh, he's credited yes. in this movie so this is early in his career and it's amazing, even this young... Well, I mean, this was made in 81. So, you know, he was about to be in V, the movie, and... Scanners. He, scanners. He literally walked off the set of this, and I think went to the Scanner set. Ooh. Because, <laughs> because Scanners was made in 82. This was made in 81. I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? Yeah. So, um, I think, yeah, Scanners came out in 83, right? The sca- scanners, scanners was made in 81, came out in 82. Oh my gosh, so he just did these basically the exact same. Yeah. Yeah. But he's captivating on film. So you talked to this Louise Harmon. I did, but I'm sure she was keeping something from me. Okay. We'll have a look into it. Can I reach you through your father? No. This is strictly between my sister and myself. Whatever. First sign of anything, we'll be in touch. Thanks. Yeah, Eddie, can I see you for a moment, please? Are you off, Frank? No, I'll be back later. Run a check and see what we've got on it. Isabel Blake, alias Tanya Kelly, and Louise Harmon. Uh, even though the camera work on this is another part sometimes, especially when they're trying to hide the fact that it's a small room but they want to kind of like I, I don't know when they first show Michael Ironside and he's talking they have the camera pan over with him walking and you can see the roof and you can tell it's black because they're in a studio <laughs> and I'm like oh guys guys <laughs> I didn't even notice that actually because Michael Ironside was on screen and I couldn't Yeah, he does nothing in this movie though by the way but like no. he's nothing to do he with it. He just talks. Yeah. He's, but his voice is great. Yeah, no. He's wonderful. Like, I loved watching him, but I was just he's like, boring. you've got nothing to do here. <laughs> he's boring as fuck, but... Uh, <laughs> Glad he's here, though. Like, yes. really enjoyed seeing him in this movie. Oh, man. Even, it's funny, even when he's babyface and young, he still looks like he's in his mid-40s. Yes. <laughs> he, still, <laughs> he still looks like Michael Ironside today. Uh, the greatest Canadian of all time. One of them. There's so many great Canadians. They're all wonderful. Well, anytime I see him, I say he's the greatest Canadian. And then when I see another Canadian actor, I like, greatest Canadian. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. I wanted to talk about the father, how skeezy he ends up being. Because you know he's doing the media company, and then you find out that he is doing, like, porn and probably underage stuff it seems to be uh, he was molesting to. his daughter and then he was having sex with his daughter so you've got porn okay whatever you're a porn schlepper no big deal some of the girls might have been underage oh okay you're a skis oh and you fucked your daughter wow well <laughs> they really build the the whole point of this killer is to get back these beta tapes which are are gorgeous these beta tapes are gorgeous as soon as I saw them they're so big and obnoxious yes. I'm yes. like you need to be in our our fucking museum yeah <laughs> right like let's uh let's put together an effort guys let's start this now analog jonesers let's find the beta tapes from american well, and let's find them send them to us and they're not like the home beta tapes that came that were just a little bit smaller than vhs's these no, are no, no, just no. the absurd these are the laser discs of vhs's <laughs> and where they're just monsters <laughs> no one wants this in their fucking home except us <laughs> yes so if you guys know where the tapes were that they used as props in american nightmare find them send them to us we want them <laughs> sold <laughs> couldn't but, say it better myself but when we found out about this father character i was actually kind of shocked because i didn't was, see that coming he was like gross 
but like in a way that everybody in this movie is gross. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, he's having sex with his daughter. I was like, Jesus. <laughs> like, yeah, that I actually text you. All right, so maybe I sent this text to you right after I watched the movie. But basically, after that scene is how I felt about this movie. I, I sent you this text. Holy moly, just finished American Nightmare. What did you have me watch? I know it's really late in Indy, but I don't care. I have to take a shower after watching that. I feel filthy. <laughs> and you were in Indiana because of Days of the Dead. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's, it, it's so sleazy. Yeah, no, I, I felt like I needed a shower afterwards. Uh, but I, I think I had to watch this movie in, like, three parts because I kept watching it before bed. And it's not it, it's a good movie. It wasn't putting me asleep, but I kept falling asleep. Um, and uh, I, watched I watched this like movie three. by myself because I didn't want Sarah to be exposed to this. <laughs> right. <laughs> Even though she watches like documentaries on straight murderers, just just the constant strippers and yeah. stripper slashing just yeah. is gross. But well, I needed three showers each time yeah. <laughs> after I was off. Let's, let's wrangle this back in. So he goes after these tapes, which have the father doing something nasty to the daughter. And the father kills himself. The killer collects these tapes. Uh, Eric and Isabel do their detective work and find out that there's a whole pile of these tapes. And then the killer has Isabel a strip on camera because Isabel's dream is to be on TV. Mm. So she goes out to be like a host right. on this telethon. Right. And he's, oh, this scene is so uncomfortable. Well, you're saying Isabel. You're talking about Louise. Louise. Uh, Isabel's uh, the sister. Yeah. We don't get, like, yeah. any more scenes with Yeah, Isabel, Isabel. is gone within yeah. five minutes. But Louise wants to be on TV, and he basically creepily makes her strip. Oh, it's so not right. It's gross, but a good scene. Like, effective scene. Like, it, yeah. It's like that scene in Fame when the girl wants to be famous. I don't know if you've ever seen the original no, I fame movie. Yeah. It's like the girl wants to be famous and basically just is like, okay, take your top off. And she's like, what? <laughs> yeah. That's basically like this scene. Uh, it is. It is one of the scenes in the movie that is incredibly uncomfortable, very memorable, and makes it a nasty film. Yeah. Yeah. Then we move on, and then it kind of just turns into stupid when he confronts <laughs> Luis and Eric on top of the building, and then Eric throws him off the building, and the movie's over. Yeah. Oh, well, wait, did we point out that the father shot himself, killed himself? Yeah, you said that. Okay, I don't I love that scene, too, where he shoots himself, because I didn't actually think that was going to happen. I didn't think anything with the father was going to happen. I honestly thought the killer got caught doing something to one of these girls, and he was shamed and embarrassed, and then it turns out, no, it's just a giant cover-up for the dad. Yeah, and then, yeah, he shoots himself. I thought that scene was really shocking, and got, that was a good, good part. But, yeah... You were saying he just throws them off the roof and it's easy. But as I mentioned before, there is still the, like, monologue that he gives. <laughs> I might rip some of that, just, like, just a minute of it, because it goes on for five minutes. Prodigal son, do you know what your father really is? Do you know the vision he has? The people he saved? Now, what's she? Or a hundred like her compared to him. We're the ones worth saving, not them. Scum like her drag people like Isabel down with them. I had to kill her too, Eric. We are the ones that can change the world, not them. We count. We matter. I can't let you ruin that. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and th the thing is, is like, we already know it's the killer. We already know why the killer's doing it, and he still tells us. Yes. It's <laughs> it's quite great. It's quite wonderful. Because I think the father does some exposition, too, before he kills himself. He's just like, why have I done this? Why did I do this to these young people? And then he blows his head off, and you're like, oh, okay, well, yeah, he runs a studio, and he's nasty, and now he can't live with himself. And now this guy's trying to get all these tapes back. Got it. And he's just like, 
Now let me explain to you why I'm doing this. Like, no! <laughs> we got it! <laughs> oh, man. They're like, no, but we got to pad this runtime out. <laughs> Him explaining it actually did confuse me for a second. I was like, wait, wait, what? I like thought I had it. And now it, and I was like, and then it came around and he finished it. I was like, no, that's what I thought the first time. <laughs> like it literally lost me for a second and then came back and I was like, okay, I was right. Okay. I know what's happening. <laughs> uh, well, uh, that's, that's it. You want to talk about now the trailer that came after the movie? Yeah. I fast forwarded because I know these old tapes, you know, media had done it and I know Universal did it, but these early eighties tapes tend to have trailers after. So I was like, let me check. I fast forward through the credits and get to the trailer for a movie that I don't know if you've seen. I have seen. I love, and I have the poster in my apartment for The Seduction with Morgan Fairchild. Morgan Fairchild is Jamie Douglas, a woman who has everything. Everything except privacy. Jamie. I want to make love to you. This guy is dangerous. He stormed into Jamie's house yesterday and terrorized her. There's not a hell of a lot I can do about it. Everything except protection. Hi, Jamie. Don't you get out of here? Come on, wet your lips. Squeeze. Please stop. Squeeze. Leave me alone. Squeeze. Get out. Huh? Only? Pull the trigger. We are not murderers. Everything except a choice. I'm not a violent person. You might have to become one, darling. Morgan Fairchild, alone, frightened, trapped like an animal. Now she's fighting back with the only weapon she has, herself. Morgan Fairchild, Andrew Stevens, The Seduction. have that what i have that poster it fell down so you've probably never seen it in my apartment but it used to be up in the felt the oh, felt but but why because the movie's amazing it's david schmoller who did tourist trap and puppet master so it's a weird movie oh that makes well the trailer's weird yeah and it's and it's basically just like a famous person being stalked by a stalker but the way they do it is so good i i highly recommend the movie it's called the seduction Tell them just about this trailer for a well, second. Well, okay, so this trailer has this woman's being stalked. She's famous, clearly. But what is so funny is the men have to go out in front of the camera because they show this scene in the trailer, and the guy's like, no, you don't understand. She feels scared. She's scared. She's a woman, and she's scared. <laughs> and I was like, uh, yeah, we got it. And the detective or whoever was just like, we can't do anything about it. He's like, I know she's a woman, and I know she's scared. And like. They didn't clearly, you know, I'm making up a little bit of this, but that's what it felt like. I was like, she can't speak for herself? <laughs> right, yeah, like all these men have to tell the audience how she feels. <laughs> uh, it's ridiculous, but Maureen Fairchild's actually really good in the movie, and she's pretty she's pretty boss in it, too. She kicks some ass in it. I I think it's a super fun movie. <laughs> I think it was a really, I'd never seen the trailer before, and it was really fun to see the trailer after this, and I was like, oh, shit. Seduction. <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't realize, now that we've talked about this film and other Canadian films, like, I didn't realize how scummy the, the Toronto Canadian like club was in these Canuck exploit Canuck exploitation movies. I have a hard time saying that. <laughs> Canuck exploitation? Yeah. I, I love these Canuck exploitation movies. This one felt different because of the American, I think, though, of it. Because usually the Canuck exploitation movies look, sound, and are violently yeah. Canadian. This one feels New Yorkish, though. <laughs> yeah, this one is made in Canada, written like an Italian mystery yeah. novel for Americans. Right. <laughs> right. Like, wait, what? <laughs> and I, and I, I'm glad you had that history on it because I didn't know if this was a retitle, like if if they. But if if they're trying to set it in Chicago, then obviously this was probably the the, the real title. I well, couldn't find any other titles when I looked this up. Everyone was making stuff for the American market at this time period because we are consumerism at its best. Yeah. And uh, especially at this point, they were just printing money on these. This tape, you know, this movie cost $200,000 to make, probably another $100,000 to distribute because, you know, everyone knows they didn't do any marketing. And then they probably, you know, doubled their money on this easy. Maybe even more. 
Oh, I'm sure media. I don't, I don't know if the filmmakers ever saw any of it, but I'm sure media made oh, a killing on this. I, I doubt any of the filmmakers. <laughs> Maybe Lynch did. Yeah. Uh, Paul Lynch. Cause he this probably game, saw, yeah, some box office, too, where when they, whenever this got released in Canada. I'm sure he got yeah. some of that. Or he was already on a deal anyway, because it seems like he did, like, three or four movies right in a row with media. Oh, okay. Just distributing yeah. it. Yeah, he probably yeah. saw the profits. And... So... Well, that's, that, that about covers it for American Nightmare. Would you recommend this to viewers if they caught this in the thrift store or in a closing video store or came across this one? Not general audiences, but if you like weird mysteries, I think this is right up your alley, and I think this plays even today. Even though it has some bad acting out of the lead actor and some weird shots, there's something about this that it, it's sticking to my bones. Yeah, I, I, I think I think I would recommend it to our listeners. Like, if you're listening to this yeah. podcast, you probably would like this movie. Well, there is an audience for these 90s and 70s thriller mysteries. Yes. I think if you like 90s thrillers and ensemble cast type movies, which there were so many in the 90s, I think you would. This is like, you know, travel back in the time. This is made in 81, but clearly it's more like a 1975 film. Yeah. Yeah, like this this one is for people that like like 70s skis. This is for people who like like those New York scummy movies. This is for people who like thrillers. This is for people who like like 90s thrillers. This is it, this one's got a lot of ground it covers. You've got to know what you're getting into though here, like know that it's going to be like a trashy movie and don't expect high art. But if you know you're getting something a little grosser and a little uh, you know fringe this is an awesome title to add to your collection, for sure. Yeah, this is kind of like the ugly coffee mug. Yeah. It might not be the prettiest, but damn it, it really... I mean, it really just, serves its purpose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on to the museum. Yeah. This is the second time I've had to reclaim my property from you. That belongs in a museum. So do you! What Do you know what you're putting in there? What am I putting in the museum? I th I think I'm going to steal yours. Okay. So I'm going to let you go first because this is your tape. Okay. Because I'm pretty sure we're putting in the same thing. I'm between two. I don't know if I want to just put the giant beta tapes in there or Dolly as the character in there. It's That's on my notes. <laughs> like, I'm I like, don't uh... know which one of those two I want to go with. Uh, we'll just put both. Let's put both in. Let's fuck it. Let's put them both in. I'll put Dolly on my side. Okay. Just because I feel like after my insane love with Will Smith, you know what? Let's just fucking pack it on. Another man. Yeah, another this two. one with the courage to be dressed like a woman. Yeah. And I think you deserve it, too, because I couldn't remember Dolly's name. <laughs> I was like, I love that character, but I didn't know the character's name. And you also deserve the giant beta tape because... If there's any man who would, like, frame this or bronze it. Oh, my God, yes. Bronze it? Yeah, <laughs> like they used mean. to do with people's kids' shoes. I hope you do that oh, yeah, with a beta tape. Nice. <laughs> if you guys, if somebody finds me a beta tape f used on set in this movie, I will bronze it, and I'll put pictures of it. <laughs> and then I will Ash get it bronzed. And Ashley will have to look at that damn thing every day. <laughs> and just shake her head and be like, what have I done? <laughs> So to fill out this episode with a little bit more, because, you know, we love talking, we're <laughs> going to do... Do we, do we talk a lot? <laughs> After all... talking an hour and a half about The Purge? <laughs> you should fucking try to edit this shit. <laughs> 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 we're going to do a top three, not five, not ten, top three Michael Ironside performance. But let's make some rules on it. One, he has to be, I'm not going to say the star, but he has to be kind of a, a lead. Okay, Okay, that or at least a, a, sem a semi-lead. That changes a couple of things for me, but okay. Okay. I'm gonna go so that, that. knocks go out a, that knocks out a movie like this, which neither of us were going to put in for Michael Ironside. Right. But you know what I mean. It take it knocks out Terminator Salvation for me. <laughs> I really like that movie. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with you. Um, <laughs> me either. So I'm going to go with my... Um, can I mention the honorable mentions? Do them all. Do them Get all. Them all. My Get honorable them all. mentions were Starship Troopers, obviously. Okay. Uh, but he needed more screen time on that, and he just didn't get it because we had to fucking put up with Johnny Rico, which I also love. <laughs> um, 
uh, all the V, V Final Battle, V miniseries, uh, he was one of the funniest, over the top, like, let's blow them all up character. Mm-hmm. The other one is Highlander 2 The Quickening, and I only like that because that's pure trash. I've never seen that one. Never seen oh, it. Oh, you fucking really? No, I've only ever seen the first Highlander in some of the show. That's oh, it. Wow. And then Turbo Kid. That one was a tough one for me to leave off. But the three, I think, here are gold. So I'm going to do it. My number three, brrr, The Machinist. Okay. Never seen that. Never oh, seen that movie. Well, Michael Ironside's character loses an arm in it. Mm. And he is such an odd, menacing character in it. And he, him and Christian Bale just talking, I could watch that all day. They're just so damn captivating. So that's my yeah. number three. What do you got? Uh, I think for my number three, I'm going to pick a, an odd pick, but I really liked his character. It's not like my favorite movie of his that he's been in, but uh, I like this character. Uh, Extraterrestrial from 2015, maybe 14. He is a pot farmer, but he knows all about the aliens. He is having a fucking blast in that role. Yeah, he does so many independent movies now that it's hard to keep up with all of his roles. He has almost, I think, 200 acting credits. Yeah, I just I just wanted to double-check my list here, and I pulled up his IMDb. He has 267 credited. Oh, wow. Yes. Wow. But uh, he, he ends up sort of being one of the heroes. He becomes sort of one of the... He's the and in that movie, basically. He has such a fun time. It's a good movie. It's not a great movie. It's a good movie. But uh, definitely watch for his role. It's super fun. Well, do you remember him on the Forbidden Zone, uh, that like nineteen eighties like sci fi where he plays the alien? I remember it, but I don't think I ever watched it. That's no. one where you can tell he's straight up just having a blast. When he's having a yeah. blast, man, yeah. it's so fucking good. Uh, my number two is Total Recall. Uh, I mean, he basically is. Uh, he's the bad guy I give a shit about. Man, he's so ruthless in it. He just like shoots innocent bystanders. He shoots the the prostitute with three boobs. Um, I'm going to blow your mind right now. I've never seen Total Recall. What? I've never seen Total Recall. That's why you never react when I yell, Quaid! Well, I know I know that. Like, I know the quotes. I know, uh, get to get your ass to Mars, or whatever it yeah. is. I know all that. I know the quotes and things, but I've never seen the movie. I fucking love. Oh, yeah, Total Recall is one of my favorite of all. And he's one of the best. Ba- oh, my gosh. So there's a story about that. I can't remember what movie he was doing, but he wanted to do um, RoboCop. And he had heard about, uh, what's the director? Verhoeven. Verhoeven. Okay. So he wanted to do RoboCop, and he'd heard about Verhoeven, I guess, from like one of the stunt people that were going to work on it. And he made a phone call, and they're like, oh, you know, we've already got a cast. Uh, what's his name? Red plays the character that he wanted to play. Hmm. I forget the actor's uh, name now. Yeah, so do I. It's not coming to me. But he's fantastic in it. So yeah. they're like, we already got the casting for that and everything. But uh, Paul Verhoeven ended up watching him in some, like, Western movie where he was, like, a uh, marshal. It was one of the movies Nick Nolte. It's when Nick Nolte was a leading man in the 80s. Gotcha. And he was in it. Paul Verhoeven saw him, really liked him, and basically said he's... Uh, Richter in Total Recall. He's like, that's my man. And they cast him. Boom. He also uh, considered Clancy Brown. Oh, wow. But he thought Clancy Brown had too much of a um, boyish look. And they ended up getting to work together in Starship Troopers. All three of them. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. So, um, and uh, he, Michael Ironside really loves Paul Verhoeven, calls him a genius, and says he's one of the greatest storytellers he's ever worked with. I'm not going to argue there, though. Dude mm-hmm. is a fucking genius. So. Yeah, I mean, it's Michael Ironside. I wouldn't argue with him no matter what. He could, he could be like, fairy's a real kid. I'll be I, like, yeah, yep. okay. Ironside said it. I fucking believe it. <laughs> Put him on a flag. <laughs> uh, what's your number two? My number two, I'm bringing it back from the podcast. Uh, Prom Night 2. So fun in that role. He, Another one where he's just having a blast. See, but is he in enough of that? I guess he is. Yeah, I he think is. he is. He's yeah. the catalyst. He's the reason. For no. the whole thing. That's fair enough. And, uh, yeah, you can listen yeah. to all of our thoughts on that movie if you go back and listen to our episode on yeah, uh, From Night 2. But uh, I, I fucking loved him in that movie. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, uh, I, that's one of my... That's one of the most fun movies I've done. I, I've watched in this yeah. podcast. Yeah. It, it's fun. 
Uh, my number one is Scanners. I've also never seen Scanners. Oh my gosh, Matt, you were blowing my head apart. <laughs> yeah, I just Scanners you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, all three of the titles that you just mentioned, I have never seen. Oh um, and, like, I've seen Scanner Cop 1 and 2, but I've never seen Scanners 1 through 3. Never seen them. I just missed it. Like, it's just one of those things that got by me. Just like Total Recall. It's like, I never didn't want to see those movies. It just, like, got by me, like, all these years. I have both of them. I've just <sighs> never watched them. Wow. 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 Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm a little disappointed. I'm a little excited because I still get to see those movies for the first time. That's true. And they are a blast. And the one of the greatest head explosions of all time. Yeah, I mean, I've seen that before. I've seen that shot over and over again. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I, like I said, I've seen the Scanner Cop movies, but I've never seen the Scanner's original trilogy. So, like, almost everything you've listed. I, I've seen V and V the Final Battle. I love V the Final Battle. That, that miniseries is incredible. I, I like that more than the original series. Like, I love V the Final Battle the most. I think but, most Americans like the Final Battle more than the original one. Because it's just crazy fun. Yeah, it's yeah. crazier. I've never seen Highlander. I've never seen Machinist. I've never seen uh, Total Recall. I've never seen Scanners. Wow. Well, all right. I, yeah. But I've seen fucking American Nightmare. Yeah, I know. That's <laughs> a. Could you imagine talking to Michael Ironside? You're like, I loved you in American Nightmare. He's like, Oh yeah. What'd you think about Scanners? Never seen. Oh, yeah, never seen it. <laughs> yeah. I I plan on remedying it soon. Uh, I have, like I said, I have both of those two. Uh, and I will. I need to see them, and I know I need to see them, but uh, I, I just never did, and I will. I will end up seeing them, and I'm sure I will end up loving them. But uh, my number one is tied, and it's one that you, it's two that you discredited, but I'm taking them both. It's Starship Troopers and Turbo Kid, tied for number one. Because I fucking love both of those movies, and he's in it just enough for me to love. <laughs> Yeah, like I said, Turbo Kid was a tough one for me to to not include. Honorable mention, Starship Troopers. I just, I, I think he needed to be in. But he's got so, his lines in Starship Troopers are amazing. Uh, it's really hard to come down to three with this guy. Yeah, I mean, that's why I had to tie my number one. Because they're pull, those, are two, those are two of my favorite performances so, from him. So, I mean, yeah, I, anything. List anything that I've seen that he's been in, I probably love his performance in it. Because he's oh. wonderful. All right, that's going to conclude our American Nightmare and slash Michael Ironside episode. <laughs> so look for us. Uh, we are now, if you'll notice, that we are on Geekscape.net, the D uh, Geekscape network now. Uh, they were Jonathan London invited us on uh, with a little nudge from uh, Matthew Kelly from Horror Movie Night. So you can go to Geekscape.net. And check out all their podcasts. Uh, it's they're a lot of fun. It's an entire community. It started as one podcast, and six years later, or ten years later, I can't remember how long they've been on. We have an entire community, and now we're part of it. Woohoo! Yeah, we're very excited to be under the Geekscape banner. Yes, I love how they're doing a bunch of interviews on their Geekscape podcast of like current directors and everything like that, and then they invite these two morons on that are still talking about VHSs from 1983. And Michael fucking Ironside. <laughs> yeah. No, no, this is awesome. It's a really cool thing and I hope pe more people find us and, and, and like just continue to grow with it. We'll probably start playing clips and ads from other podcasts on Geekscape so if you hear that now you know why. And if you didn't listen to this episode, what's wrong with you? <laughs> also, I do want to point out before we say our salutations and goodbyes um we announced on uh independence day we announced on independence day that we were gonna do american nightmare next and we goofed and we did the first purge next so if you came to this episode after we did independence day go back and listen to our first purge episode because it was a really fun episode and we had uh katie glidewell from the movie irrational fear join us so we have a guest and it's a really fun episode where we all three disagree about the Purge movie. Well, I think Katie and I were on the same in the same boat, and you were outside with like a life raft, and you're like, "I'm good, guys. I like it." As I tend to usually. Be. <laughs> <laughs> like got a bag of Doritos, and you're like, "I like it." <laughs> I'm great on my life raft on my own. <laughs> uh, so yeah, go back and check that yeah. one out. We goofed. That that is the episode after Independence Day. Then this one. So go back and check it out. 
Yes, and like we say every episode, uh, rate and review us on iTunes. Helps a lot. Like our Facebook page, and you can listen to us on so many things now. Google Play, iTunes like usual, but we also have our Podbean, and we're on Stitcher, we're on, oh gosh, YouTube, so many things, and now Geekscape.net. Yeah, so please, and thank you again for all the rates and reviews that you have given us. Everything helps, so please continue to do so. And for fun, list your top three Michael Ironside performances on our Facebook page, because let's talk about it. The guy's great. Yeah, no matter what you're going to pull out, it's going to be a great performance, so do it. All right, remember to be kind. Rewind.